Hey there, welcome to Sauce and Bound Podcast. I'm your host, I'm Dana, head of growth at Sauce Group, a serial acquirer buying wonderful sauce businesses to take them to the next level. And here I chat with inspiring founders and experts to get an inside scoop on how they made their business success. And today with me is Katie, co-founder and CEO at Ecomio, helping companies to reach their climate targets while realizing significant savings in business travel. Really great. This is what we're also passionate about at South Grove. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm very excited to our talk. Sure. Well, I'm glad you're here. So let's dive in and um, probably let's just start with your background and like how you came to building Ecomio in the first place. Sure. Yeah, um, I can talk a little bit about my background and then maybe an anecdote on how we got to discover the problem and the pain that we're solving for our customers. Um, so by training, I'm an engineer. Um, I, I studied in ETH in, in Zurich and in the US. Um, and then um, I never really went into engineering in the end. I went into the dark chambers of consulting um, and was traveling a lot. So I had to go typically Monday to Thursday to customers and um, took a lot the plane, obviously. Um, so I saw already there some, some weird behaviors, people taking a detour just in order to keep their miles and more status. And uh, actually my project manager back then said, that's the best practice, you should, you should follow it. Otherwise you're kind of dumb if you don't take the, the best benefit out of your trips. Um, well, and then I was based in, in Zurich um, for, for the consulting company and there was a situation which caught my awareness. Um, I was uh, on a due diligence and um, as so often back then, the German colleagues were coming over to support because we were quite a small office and um, usually you would expect that they would stay in the Marriott hotels of the world. Um, and this time turns out they went to an Airbnb. So it was three guys sleeping in an Airbnb with one bed and one sofa couch. And I was like, what's going on? There must be something wrong. You poor guys. Uh, did they cut the budget or something? And they said, no, no, no. Uh, we all do this here on purpose because there's a tax benefit that we can get from our employer, um, which is tax free. If we sleep privately and don't go to a hotel, it's kind of as if you would stay with your grandma instead of going to a hotel. So saving costs for the company. In Germany, that's quite low, but in Switzerland, it turns out for them, it was, I think, around 180 euro per night per person. So what they did, smart as those consultants were, using their own benefits, um, they went to a Airbnb for 100 euro per person per night, took the rest, the 80 for themselves, and uh, yeah, had a great benefit and the company was saving money. And to me, there, there, there I saw like a win-win uh, win situation that I wanted to leverage. First of all, I leveraged it for myself because I rented my apartment afterwards to those guys um, and said, uh, I'm not here, I'm going away to other projects. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's benefit together from this. That's another story. But f for us, basically, there was the initiator because we saw that um, what I heard so far is, no, but we cannot go to Airbnbs. Are you kidding me? Like, uh, it's way too low of a standard. And it seemed like um, for those guys, it was okay because they were used to it to do to go to an Airbnb with three people with one bed. Um, also, when they went on a private trip. So, um, for me, I saw there is a huge gap between how people travel for business and privately, and that's the first step to close this gap. So as you hear, it was, first of all, a lot about cost. Um, and then um, I took a sabbatical from being in consulting, took some time for myself. Um, everyone told me, it's obvious that you will not come back. I was like, no, 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 maybe I'll come back. Um, they were all right. Um, it was obvious that I wouldn't come back. Um, and that's when I started kicking off with some ideas. I had tons of other ideas um, on the side, but we started with this one. Um, and what we, uh, what we discovered First was a very important insight uh, with customer data, basically. We saw um, that um, CO2 and cost were actually correlating in 90% of the cases. And so that's, first of all, a nice fact, because that means if you reduce one, you also reduce the other one. So good for sales. But what was important to understand is the connecting factor is the comfort level. So that's when we went back to the original situ situation. The business travelers need something um, in order to go down with their comfort level to save cost and to save CO2. And that's the basic principle that we brought into business travel um, with 
our solution Ecomio. Um, but obviously we're also wondering why is there not such a solution yet on the market? Um, and we looked around, first of all, we didn't really understand, but we started anyways. And at some point, um, our senior advisor, Patrick Dima joined us. Um, he used to be the CEO of Air Plus, the biggest um, credit card solution um, for business travel and also in the board of Miles and More. So he knows the industry and he got to explain us um, how actually the incentives works for the existing suppliers, the existing um, solution providers. And what we got to understand is they're all transaction based, which means the more they sell, the better for their business. And as we know that cost and CO2 were correlated, this is a huge problem because the suppliers that are selling the, the trips, the online booking tools, the travel management companies, they are not incentivized at all to go for carbon savings because they would reduce their revenue. I can name you some examples, but this is basically what we saw that those are um, hiding away from pushing towards sustainable travel, although we all need it in today's world. And that's where we disrupt the industry with our solution. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, uh, I need to. I really need to look more into this because, well, we're all you know remote and asynchronous, and we don't really travel uh, much at SaaS Group. But, uh, like for example, now I will, right? And it's a very long way for me. I'm based in Vietnam. Uh, go into yeah. OMR conference. Uh, it's literally twenty hours uh, on on the plane, and then you know. All, all the costs added uh, for, for accommodation and stuff. Um, so we're always looking for solutions that, you know, could reduce our uh, CO2 production uh, into the world. But uh, that's, you know, lots of huge companies that travel frequently. Uh, so how did you approach them in the first place? Because like you said, it's, you know, people are using their miles and people mm. have all these partnership programs. Why would they change anything? Yeah, so, I mean, luckily I came out of consulting. So I started with my former employer. Um, but turns out uh, when I took my sabbatical one month after COVID hit, so no one was traveling anymore. <laughs> so we had a bit of an issue here because the market went from 100 to zero within one or two weeks. And everyone had other problems than optimizing their travel towards carbon reduction. So for us along the journey, it was very important to stay close to potential customers and start the discovering journey of a pain that was constantly changing throughout COVID because what we saw is um, before COVID, the CO2 reduction was maybe, let's say priority number six. Whereas after COVID suddenly it ranked up and up and up and up. And right now it's number two, if not even number one, depending a little bit on, on the company. Um, so we stayed very close with the customers in terms of we approached them and said, hey, we do not have a solution, but we would like to build something. Would you help us? So asking for help, people always are happy to take 15 minutes out of their day and support you. And this is also how we got to know our first customers in the end, because those were the people who helped us understand their pain and therefore then also bought the solution. So as you can hear, we, we started with consulting companies. I was uh, basically texting every friend of mine that I knew who was working in consulting. Hey, can you connect me with this or this person? So it was a lot of LinkedIn work connecting with people. Um, and that's how we got started. And um, once we saw, okay, the solution is actually solving the pain and there's a willingness to pay for it, which is worth it for building a business. Um, we obviously expanded. And what we saw is that um, our solution is most applicable for companies with at least uh, 1,000 employees, maybe rather 5,000 employees. What we rather say is um, more than 1,000 flights uh, per year is attractive to us. So that's not too many companies, as you can imagine, um, and a lot of big companies. So um, in those companies, you don't sell from one day to another. It's a real journey that you need to go along with. You need to build trust. So what helps us a lot to approach customers today is basically going to events um, being present with the customers. And um, I'd say we, uh, we probably know uh, at least some person um, in all of the companies that could be potential customers by now, uh, because it will take 
several years to convert a customer. The fastest we were was uh, three months so far, but we usually talk about several months, if, if not even years, to convert a customer. Okay. All right. So with such long sales cycles, what is is it your biggest kind of challenge going from zero to one? Or if mm. not, then what is? Um, so from zero to one uh, depends obviously how you how you define one. When did you reach one as one product market fit or one the first year on the bank account? Um, so for us, as I already mentioned, it was very important to stay close to the customers because the pain was changing. It was not a constant pain that we discovered up front and let's build fast, but it was like um, seeing the pain that we want to address changing and then building a solution upon it. Um, so the the biggest challenge I'd say for us was um, to have a market view, an overall market view, because uh, what we did is um, we started basically off um, with uh, one of the potential biggest customers, three biggest customers worldwide approaching us, finding us on LinkedIn with not having a product and saying, hey, we need this solution. We're working um, on this. We are currently conceptualizing it and we need someone to provide it to us. It seems like you have it. At that point we said we did not have it, obviously. Um, so we started a co-creation with them, um, which was extremely good because we were extremely close to the customer. Uh, we had like a project team on their side, we had our team on the other side. And at the same time, we were too close to the customer because we only saw this customer. We didn't see the rest of the market and kind of diversified. And it's very easily said that you should diversify, but obviously if you have the carrot hanging there with a potential revenue and a big customer and they want to build this with us, that's where you focus on. So. Um, to me, that was the biggest challenge, and I'd say also um, a failure that we had in the beginning, um, this balance of focusing on the specific customer, but actually having several customers in a row to focus on to see the overall market demand and not a specific customer problem. So how did you how get, did you get out of this? Because, yeah, I, I can totally imagine <laughs> like just, you know, building it for for some huge company and then uh, there is a risk of maybe becoming like just a, a nice addition to that one company or even a feature or, you know, integrating with them at, at mm. some point. Um, yeah. How did you decide that? Oh, you know, time to space out. <laughs> yeah, to be very frank, we didn't date it. Um, so um, we were not ready to to sell a product and their steering committee saw that it was too risky for them. Um, so in the end, uh, we put the project on hold. We're again in contact with them, but um, uh, that I would say helped us actually to build a scalable product in the end, uh, them actually coming back to us and saying, okay, after one and a half years working together, having a project work, we need to stop this year. Um, and after this, we realized, we kind of woke up from a dream and said like, what did we do here? We need to go on the market. And um, also very luckily, we just closed our first funding round um, back then. And we had great investors supporting us, uh, sparing what we need to do, how we need to think in order to um, go from the original concept and the first bits of software to a scalable solution. Okay, perfect. So, uh, and you know, of course, uh, since you're building for businesses, especially such big businesses, it makes sense for them to, you know, only kind of introduce this initiative if it has impact on their revenue. So uh, how do you see, as of now, companies implementing Ecomeo, um, mm. how does it help them save money and potentially, you know, get uh, higher chances of getting investment or better talent? Because a lot of people, uh, according to some surveys, would rather go and work for companies that have this green air initiatives than to others that don't. Yeah, uh, we talk about this a lot on the team. What is actually the one buying reason um, for the customers? And I'd say in theory, yes, it's all of this, your future proof, your track more talent and so on. It's obviously extremely difficult to measure, um, but what, we discussed lately is that our gut feeling tells us that currently it's still about the image. It's not really a rational reason behind. Um, this will change in the very near future with the um, regulations coming up in the EU especially. 
um, where you have also restrictions on getting investments from uh, from investors, from banks or whatever. Um, but so far what we see is they want to get started with something. They want to show that they are active and obviously within business travel it's a great space to start with because that's what every employee sees if you change your um, provider for um, your electricity that might be one message within a newsletter within the intranet but the next week it might be also forgotten whereas within business travel you can reach really everyone everyone travels at some point um, and you can really change a culture and that's what we also bring into the company i talked in the beginning about our incentives but uh, obviously we built uh, something bigger here already and um, by bringing in educational messages making it emotional bringing it um, towards the company level so um, what is actually good what is bad for my company that might look different for mckinsey versus a SaaS group um, and then there's also the whole governance coming around it, um, looking at carbon taxes, carbon budgets. So this field is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but basically, to answer your question, what we see so far is the main driver is still the overall image. I want to show that I do something. Okay, that makes sense. And I mean, it's probably still a valid point to start with. Um, like whatever drives you towards something bigger and better, it could be still a good beginning. But, um, you know, since, since we started talking, you know, about your ICP and that you're selling to companies that are one to 5,000 uh, people, but, you know, we're, we're not there yet, for example, right? We are fairly small, I would say, uh, about like 300 people. So what kind of green initiatives, especially in the travel space, could mm. we be looking at, could we be implementing and companies like SaaS Group? Yeah, yeah, good question that, that we are also obviously thinking about when we think about extending our ICP. And um, what we see for, for bigger companies that, it's, that is also applicable for smaller companies is to start with your internal levers, aka your travel policy. So what is allowed, what is not allowed. And we see the big companies are struggling to implement this um, because there needs to be an, a thousand rules of exception because there's the management that still wants to fly business uh, class and so on. Um, whereas in smaller companies, if I, for example, um, with my co-founders, we tell our 12 employees, um, hey, um, we will not take the plane on routes where there's a train alternative for nine hours then that's just the case. There's no way around it and that's the company culture. So um, it's a combination of the policy, but obviously this needs to come from a leadership and a um, role model perspective, because if I'm not doing it, then why should my employees do it? Um, so the smaller the company, the more you can do from the leadership perspective, I believe. Um, and if that's not the case, if the leadership is not leaning towards sustainability, carbon reduction, then it needs to come from the employees. The employees need to raise the awareness to the um, leadership, which is also quite difficult, I know, and challenging, and not a lot of people want to stand up, even if they, they might have a strong opinion. But that's necessary in order for us to actually avoid a, cl a climate crisis. We need the, the common movement, and that's mostly, as you said, coming up from, from uh, the, the younger people um, in, in the company. So um, those two factors are, are, I believe, very important, the activism from down and the good leadership from up. Um, and what we see still on top um, is, although we're focusing on Europe, we see that um, at least us, we're currently living in a bubble. Um, we think that everything we know, also other people know, but that's not the case. Um, so it's a lot about education, um, setting things into relation. Um, what I heard from a, from a friend at some point is, uh, yeah, you know, I know I'm flying like once a month to New York because I love the city, but I'm vegan. And you just need to put things into relation because most people do not know that um, there's a factor 10x here between uh, going from uh, eating meat to not eating meat and uh, flying 12 times per year uh, around the globe. Um, so this is something we still need to bring in and raise the awareness of the, let's say, bigger crowd versus only our bubble probably the two of us are also in the same bubble 
Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we also discussed it with, uh, with Luba Mila from Plan A. It's great to have initiative. And, you know, obviously we have Tim Schumacher uh, at, at SaaS Group, right? Who's uh, an investor in all the green initiatives out there and uh, really trying to boost our awareness. And we do have uh, people who take great initiative to like educate the rest of the company. Uh, but one of the problems uh, that I also see, and that's very relevant, you know, there is a good initiative, but there is also your job and the priority will always be your job. So it's very difficult to kind of just, you know, push that, um, you know, how long can you push something that other people don't engage with? So I guess I'm just always trying to like find out like what is even in your company. And I mean, for you, it's probably uh, easier because you all came together for this, um, for this idea, but, uh, how to, how to motivate people to be aware and to, to get out of the bubble and, you know, to learn a bit more of what we can do and implement in our daily lives. Yeah. So, um, I thought about this a lot also because I had a huge change. I was flying business class between Zurich and Stuttgart. Um, where today, if I would see someone doing this, uh, I don't know, I would love to throw some paint at them or <laughs> whatever. Um, so I had a huge shift and I was thinking back what motivated actually my shift. And I think in the end, it comes all down to social norms. What is accepted, what is not accepted, what is good, what is bad. And the cool thing uh, that we can do with our tool within the booking process is we integrate into the existing booking process and um, we can uh, create a reality which is my, maybe not there yet, um, kind of um, in the right, taking the right words and changing the reality for or the, the perceived reality for people. Um, we work, for example, together with a behavioral scientist and uh, he got um, to explain us that every person wants to belong to the better third of the society. So you can phrase things in different ways, but basically if you make people um, go towards the better thirds, that's always great. And um, you really need to go specifically. You cannot just say flying is worse than train. Well, everyone knows that already. You need to make it specific for the route, specific for the company, the context and your social surrounding. Um, if you know that everyone, 99% of your colleagues is taking a train between Munich and Berlin. Um, maybe you don't want to say out loud that you just came by plane to Berlin. Um, and that's just the start. Um, so it's a lot about the, the perception, I believe, and the, the social norms. Because for me, if I would take a plane out between Berlin and Munich, I don't want to see the looks and the, the comments of my co-founders um, in every single call that I would enter. Um, so yeah, it's about the, the common movement, I'd say, and um, changing the perception. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. So uh, since we already started with like education, I feel like it's such a tough space to be in when you have to educate people on top of selling your product to them. Uh, so what works for you? What kind of approach uh, do you have in acquiring customers through that um, educating movement? Uh, what works best for you? So I differentiate between customers and users. Um, I, I talked uh, a ton now about users, what, what we do bringing in the, the social awareness, for example. Um, when it comes to customers, I'm shared, I have to say. I mean, obviously, we, we do things to educate them. We are in touch with them. We show them case studies. We are on panels and so on. We have webinars together with the leaders of the of the, of the the space, uh, Citric and BCD Travel, the, the, the real big players, um, in order to also help them in the end uh, fulfill their customer requests. But I'm shared because in the end, those companies are so slow and they are finally, let's say, the majority there that they measure their CO2 footprint and they set themselves targets. That's also due to the regulations, luckily. Um, and the next steps 
this, that's actually also part of the regulations is showing uh, so-called transition plans. So how do you actually get to achieve your targets? And there we see that a lot of companies are not there yet. We're still before the wave, although we actually do not have the time um, because in big companies, a decision is not taken like this. It's a long process. It's a planning, it's scenario building, it's going through different steer codes. And then you decided for something and then you look for the solution in order to fulfill your strategy. So we see that um, a lot of companies are in this phase currently. And when it comes to educating for us, it's important to make them aware, hey, there's something you can do in your online booking tool to achieve your, your targets. Um, but then getting them to a customer that's part of the sales cycle, um, it's a long process and also part of the timing where we see um, the market is not necessarily there yet to um, to implement actually their strategies. Right. Okay. So let's come back to the to the product a little bit. Uh, and I know that um, before you launched um, or while you were uh, looking for for your customers, you took part in an incubator program. And you know there is a lot of beef around right now about you know, being bootstrapped or taking the VC money and going to incubators and how maybe incubators don't make sense anymore. How did you feel about it? Because honestly, on the podcast, I don't think we ever had anybody who went through an incubator program. Mm. Um, how does it, yeah, how, how was the experience and what did it give you? Yeah, uh, interesting that you never had someone who went through an incubation program. Um, yeah, I, I think... think so. Maybe I cannot even count the number of incubation programs on one hand um, because we went through several. And the reason is not necessarily in order to get to know the theory, like what shall I do? There's no rules in the end. You need to find out what's good for you um, in practice for your specific example. And you have very few experts that can help you. The probability that you will find this expert in the incubation program is there, but you cannot really count on it. So. To me, why we actually went through several incubation programs is um, the founders. So I, I would say in a, in a journey of, of founding a company, um, you often feel very alone um, because there's pains, there's things not working and you doubt yourself a lot. Is it me? Is it me? Or is this actually something that everyone else also goes through? Like for example, hiring takes forever and it's so much effort. Like am I doing something wrong? And just having the experience of founders that are in the same stage or let's say a year um, ahead of you helps so much. And that's um, through those incubation programs, how I build up my whole network of um, people that I do regular sharing with. If I have a question coming from the team or myself, um, I basically first think, okay, which founder might have had the same problem? And I have them kind of on speed dial and call them up um, the best example is um, I was with the founder of uh, Finway, for example, in an incubation program, and she invited me yesterday to a CEO dinner. And there again, I got to know so many amazing people that are one or two years maybe ahead of us. And you can discuss things that you might not even have on your mind, but they have learned and you can learn from them. So it's to me a lot about peer learning, not the, 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 um, the, the theory that they might put up front in sessions. I very frankly, I usually don't dial in there or don't listen. Um, now I, I can maybe say that, that the programs are over, but that's what helped me a lot. And through this also, I discovered the big benefit to me of having also a pure female network partly, because I felt that in a room with only women, um, there's way more vulnerability. And that's in the end what you need in order to learn from each other. If you say everything is great all the time and hey, I raised X million and uh, we had X uh, revenue last year, that doesn't help me. I need to hear what went wrong and how, what I can learn from it. Okay, interesting. That's a great perspective. I didn't, I never thought about it from like that point of view, but what you just said about peer learning and, you know, just being in the community makes total sense. I mean, uh, even for us, like when we do our events and they're nothing like an incubator program and we don't even uh, usually have like a topic to discuss uh, when we get founders together, mm. just the networking effect and like, yeah, figuring out what everyone does and what the challenge is and, you know, maybe figuring out how they can work together. 
um, in the future is so great. Yeah, that's why we keep doing this. I think it's um, yeah, being remote and asynchronous is great. And you know, internet has helped us to find all the amazing connections out there. But personal events are just next level engagement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, I just uh, just wanted to to ask you a couple more questions because you mentioned a few you know regulations coming in the EU and just you know I feel like climate climate regulations and AI regulations is something like you always have to like pace with because it's just going so fast. Uh, so what's uh, what's coming in the industry that you are most kind of thrilled about? Mm. Yeah, um, I love one move that the EU did, which will be influencing the whole world in the end. If I remember collect correctly, in 2028, every company that has a location within uh, the EU, but has the headquarter outside of the EU, will need to fulfill the same criteria as the companies that are headquartered in, uh, headquartered in the EU. So think about a Coca-Cola, a US company, um, they will need to fulfill the EU regulations, otherwise they're not allowed to sell here anymore or they're not allowed to have the, the location anymore. So it's super smart um, because in the end, Europe will be the role model. Europe will need to speed up the process to decarbonize our world. Uh, we see what's going on in the US. So let's see what happens with, with the elections, but it doesn't look so great. Looking towards the east, there's also not so much drive towards sustainability because there's also a lot of growth still happening. So there's the, the trade-off. So who else in the EU would be responsible to bring this in the world? And it's a, an amazing thing. And I think there will be um, super interesting uh, market dynamics also coming out of it. Okay. Yeah, it is exciting. So, and what is next for Ecomeo? What are you guys building? What are you guys investing in? What's your next focus? Yeah, I think focus is the key word. Um, we have a lot of ideas that we want to do next. So the next step is actually to find our focus. Um, there's uh, different directions that we can go in terms of growth, in terms of ex expansion, but we're only a team of 12 so far. Um, so it's really to identify the next area. Um, there is perspectives to um, grow our ICP towards also smaller companies. Um, what we are also looking at is to go a step before this, the, the reduction itself, the decarbonizing, so that we can have a first entry point and help our customers before to get actually there in terms of um, CO2 measuring and building up the strategies. And then um, the third part is also to um, go into other countries because we started so far in Germany, but in France and the UK, it's big markets and they have the same issue um, and it takes a while to build relationships. So also here, taking the first step um, is very important to do this early on um, so that the market is aware of our solution. And I've been uh, in, in Paris last week and had a great, great insights into the market and a, a very good feeling about the potential there. So um, a lot of things to come, um, growing the team. Um, and yeah, it's a very exciting time again. That's exactly uh, why I founded a company in order to just discover different directions. Perfect. All right. Okay. That's great. So that's great to hear. Uh, I'm really looking forward to see like what, what you guys do next, but so far, what has been, you think, for you personally or for the company, the biggest win and the biggest failure? Mm. It's difficult to say there's one biggest and one, uh, yeah, one, one biggest win and one biggest failure. When it comes to failure, I, I think uh, looking towards the moment where, where we had most difficulties and we felt like we're failing and uh, everything will, will go nuts um, as the situation that ended before when we lost the one big customer, because in the end, we just raised our first funding round um, and two weeks later they, say, they said we put this project on hold and that was the whole reason we were able to raise such a great round. So it was a big challenge to uh, um, ensure that we still have the trust level with our investors, that this was just happening to us and we had no clue before. Um, and then also starting kind of from, from scratch again, going back to the whiteboard and saying, 
what do we need to build here for the markets? From investor perspective, it might seem, hey, such a good timing for you. For us, it felt really like so much pressure on our shoulders because we had to perform now. We had uh, expectations that we didn't have before from investors and we obviously had our own expectations and the team. So that was really um, um, a big moment of frustration and going back, but at the same time, drive um, to, to build something that's, that's relevant. Um, when it comes to win, um, also thinking about where we have maybe the, the, the biggest positive emotions. I mean, there's customer wins, there's fundraising, there's uh, team onboarding, but in the end, I think nothing of this would be possible if I wouldn't have found by coincidence my two co-founders, Sarah and Mario. Um, I see uh, other startups that are having a single founder that I um, that I'm the mentor for, and it really doesn't seem like a nice ride um, because you cannot share your pains, um, you cannot offload work if you also have something, for example, going on in your private life that distracts you. Um, some women at some point become a mother. What do you do with your startup then? Um, so I'm extremely grateful that somehow at this moment we found each other. And it was a great match um, without having deeply worked before. Um, and in the end, I think there was also a lot due to going through a lot of personal and business crisis together. We, for example, also were affected by the SVB bankruptcy. 90% uh, of our money was at SVB. Luckily, we got it back. Um, but it was a horrible weekend for all of us. Um, and yeah, this this just brings us together closer. and. Um, yeah, it's just a, such a big coincidence that we have such a similar mindset in the end. Um, so yeah, very grateful for that. <laughs> Sounds great. Now, I, we talk a lot here about, you know, founder dynamic and, you know, if it's better or worse to be the only founder or to have a team and obviously, you know, opinions split, but I, I think I feel what, what you're talking about, you know, just, just having that support system really helps uh, go through this demanding journey. Um, okay. And well, the last question is, is about hack, uh, always <laughs> about hack. So anything you can share, you know, that could be, you know, maybe unconventional, maybe helping companies to, uh, implement the greener initiatives, or maybe something that worked for you in terms of, you know, processing this long sales cycles or hiring the best people. Mm, yeah. I mean, there's, there's tons of hacks how you can travel greener. Um, I will say one or two so that uh, I, I shared my knowledge and we have the impact together, but then I will go on the startup specific stuff. So um, when you want to travel green, um, always take the train in, uh, instead of the plane, obviously. Um, but also when you take the plane, there's potential to reduce. If you go um, to the next startup uh, summit, there is potential when you take a different airline. Luckily, um, you can book by yourself. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot use our tool to see where the lower emitting airline is, but a good reference is to go to Google Flights. Um, and you will be surprised um, that actually the low cost airlines have a lower footprint also um, on average uh, than the airlines like uh, Swiss um, or, or Lufthansa. Um, and uh, on top, the service class also makes up a big amount of it because in the end you take up more space, more weight in the plane, whereas you could put a second person, it's kind of like the car sharing principle. You divide your CO2 footprint by more people. Um, so keep those things in mind, the, um, the capacity factor and the airline factor um, and check ideally on Google flights um, if, if you book by yourself uh, what what the carbon footprint is and um, yeah choose the right flight if you have to fly um, yeah and then for the for the hacks in the, in the startup daily life one uh, let's say attitude that we discovered with uh, our team coach actually um, is uh, the so-called gut feeling um, where I'm an engineer, our CTO Mario is an engineer, uh, so we have a lot of rational thinking in the team, um, very structural and this needs to happen because of this. But in the end, I'm also reading currently a book called Alchemy. Um, if you innovate, it cannot necessarily be explained because it's new, because you don't have this chain of reasonings. So being okay with having not 
a perfect explanation of something, trying it out anyways, and seeing that it works, and then you can maybe go back and reasoning it to something else. But um, listening to your gut feeling, I think, um, had a lot of impact on our team so that we also move faster. If we cannot decide upon something because we don't have all the arguments, we ask ourselves, what does your gut feeling say? And then we, we go with this one because there is something behind our gut feeling that we can explain, um, but there's still um, a reason behind it. And one specific situation, how I applied this in, in my personal slash business life is uh, regarding holidays. So um, I decided not to take any more one week of holidays because it's always stressful before and after. So I either go for long weekends or at least two weeks in a row, um, which is both more difficult, um, but in the end, to me, has a higher impact on my uh, relaxation and setting back um, and coming back with a lot of energy. Okay, that's a good one. I think it makes sense. One week, you know, you're nor here nor there. Uh, and uh, yeah, you could kind of come back like, is it over? Uh, and uh, yeah, I feel like, okay. Yeah, next time I will try two weeks too. I, think <laughs> I always take one yeah. week off. Let's try that. I will. I'm. I'm sorry. I will not travel <laughs> by train from Vietnam to Germany. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> it will take weeks, but that could be my two week. Yeah. Vacation. For example, combining trips is oh, also um, a great way to do it. Yeah. All right. But thanks so much for sharing those. I think uh, and gut feeling also like. We even discussed it in m a because sometimes you're looking at a company, it may not be, you know, a perfect match in terms of numbers, but something tells you like, hey, mm. that's a great company. We're going to have so much fun working together. And um, I think we had a few of those examples that worked out really great. So yeah, gut feeling is, uh, is, a, is a cool hack. All right. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Um, I mean, it was great talking with you. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and, uh, you know, all the best with uh, Ecomio. I'm excited to do it again. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And uh, all the best for Zas Group. It sounds like also a great mission and uh, enjoy your trip to Germany. Thank you so much and take care.